Good evening and welcome everybody. We're just going to wait for a couple seconds to see if a few more people are going to log in, but I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to 2021 Godfrey L. Cabot Award. I'm very, very excited and pleased to be able to make this award tonight. Unfortunately, due to circumstances, the award had to be postponed in 2020. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be able to, to, to make the award to some very worthy recipients tonight. I'm David Hampson, president of the Aero, the Aero Club of New England, with first Aero Club in the Americas. And there's a rich history of our Cabot Award going all the way back to 1952, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. So just to first give you a brief overview of the agenda tonight, um, we're going to talk a little about the history of the Cabot Award. And I'm going to then introduce our recipients, Tyson Weiss and Jason Miller, the founders of Four Flight. Then they will provide a short video. And afterwards, there'll be a question and answer session moderated by our ACON secretary, Keith Leonhardt. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box during the course of the presentation. And we can address them during the question and answer session. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of great questions. And I, I'm sure, I know many of us are big users of ForeFlight. I know I am and have been for many years. So to provide a little bit of history of the, the, the Godfrey L. Cabot Award, it was established in 1952. The original award was established by Godfrey L. Cabot and honors and perpetuates his memory and in his you know the definition of what the award represents which was that recipients shall be individuals or teams that made significant unique and unparalleled contributions to advance and foster aviation or space flight and there have been some amazing recipients over the years beginning in 1952 with with Igor Sukowski and on this slide it shows a list of the many people that we've had over the years many of them are names you recognize Crocker Snow, we've had Harrison Ford, Clay Lacey, Chuck Yeager, just to name a few. Um, and it, we, we've awarded the award every year with the exception of two years. Um, and of course, one of them being last year during unprecedented circumstances. And certainly the founders of Four Flight uh, fit among these aviation greats and what they've contributed to aviation, aviation in general and aviation, and aviation safety specifically. Now, Four Flight was first introduced in 2006 as a desktop application. I didn't even realize it was only it was available at that time, but it started as a desktop application. Originally, originally, so you could only ask, access it on your on your computer, a laptop or desktop. Then, when it, when the first i i the first iPhone came out, it was then available as an app, and then later on the iPad, and that's when I first became introduced to Four Flight when I was doing my private pilot training. And I was struggling with paper charts, as many of us do, and trying to open them up in the airplane, and 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 obviously and obviously charting chart out my cross country flights. And my instructor introduced me to four flight, and it almost seemed too easy to be able to to do all my flight planning on my iPad. It's something I've used ever since, and it's become it's since become so important not only to general aviation and pleasure flying, but also to to military commercial flying as well as part of having an electronic flight bag. And not only can you chart your flights on four flight, but you can do you can you can file flight plans, you can get weather briefings, you can look at weather forecasts over you know over a long period of time to them all out for statistics as well. And there's many other features that are constantly added. So it's you know there's old saying that everything in aviation is expensive. I think this, this is an exception to that because four flight annual subscription is one of the best deals out there and is a real bargain, I, I think, in my opinion, especially with all of the advancements that ha happen on a regular basis. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about, about uh, bestowing this award on, on our recipients. But before we do and before we get to the video, I'd like to find a bit more background about our two recipients of the award tonight. First, I'd like to introduce Tyson Wise, who's a co-founder and CEO of Four Flight which is now a Boeing company, as, as some of you may know. And Four Flight's a market leading pr provider of integrated flight applications for personal, business, military, and commercial aviation. Tyson is the recipient of the Aaron Osman Entrepreneur of the Year Award, also a recipient of the prestigious Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association General Aviation Safety Award for measurably improving the safety of flight, and a member of the Texas Aviation Hall of Fame. In addition to serving on the NBAA board, Tyson also serves on the boards of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association 
as well as the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Tyson is an active instrument rated turbojet pilot and holds multiple type ratings for business aviation aircraft. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a computer science degree from Trinity University in San Antonio, and an MBA from Rice University's Graduate School of Management. And then um, our other co-founder of Four Flight and honoree tonight, Jason Miller. Um, he's currently the, the CTO, Chief Technology Officer of Four Flight. Jason grew up in South Carolina, avidly listening to flying stories from his grandfather, a B-24 pilot in World War II. Those stories sparked a goal of learning to fly. After working on the ramp at the local airport to finance lessons with the generous matching funds from his parents, Jason soloed at age 16 and got a certificate at 17. In the early 1990s, Jason's dad was working to bring internet service to their part of the state. He brought home a 9600 baud modem and after getting it working on the X386 desktop, Jason fell in love with networking and software. From there, a natural path was to study computer engineering at Clemson University. After meeting and marrying his wife, Krista, the two were the first full-time hires at a new software company specializing in genomic research. After getting his instrument rating in 2001, Jason realized he needed software to help interpret MEDAR and TAF weather data, compare the winds to the airport layout. He created a desktop application called ForeFlight. It went live in February 2006 and sold roughly a copy per day at $28 each. Tyson reached out to introduce himself in September of that year. In 2007, they joined forces to start a new company focused on taking ForeFlight to much higher heights. After Apple's release of the first iPhone, the pair quickly decided to focus on that platform as the one secure source the aviators would want to consult to get all their charts, airport details, and weather data. Since then, Jason has, won many, has worn many hats in the company, lead app developer, lead designer, business development support, evangelist, and cheerleader. During his time with ForeFlight, Jason has had the privilege of flying an SR-22 and TPM all over the country and beyond to meet with customers, fellow team members, and many others throughout the aviation industry. And I'll say that ForeFlight had a, they had a booth as I always do at NBAA this year. And that's actually where I'm broadcasting tonight. I was at the NBAA convention in Las Vegas. I'm, I'm here now, last day of the, of the event. And you know, this is a, last year they canceled the convention where they did it virtually, I should say, because of the pandemic. This year is in person with some restrictions and the attendance was a little bit less than obviously the normal still. But walking around the convention hall, you know, I saw many booths that were kind of empty compared to what I normally see. But the one booth that was still buzzing with energy and lots of people was for flight, which I think is just that alone is a testament to what is done for general aviation. So along with that, I'd like to offer my congratulations to uh, Tyson Weiss and Jason Miller, very worthy recipients of the 2021 Cabot Award. Hello, Aero Club of New England. I'm Tyson Wise, co-founder and CEO of ForeFlight. And I'm Jason Miller, the other co-founder and uh, CTO of ForeFlight. Well, thanks for uh, you know, having us and, and giving us an opportunity to, to visit uh, with you. We are super thrilled and honored uh, for, uh, to be nominated uh, for the Aero Club of New England's uh, Cabot Award and be among uh, the other recipients of this. Um, it's been you know, great privilege for us to be able to you know, build a solution and uh, share that with uh, the aviation uh, community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I thought, you know, one of the things that might be good, Tyson, would be for us to sort of talk a little about the history and sort of how we got to where we where we are now, and maybe even a little bit about like the place we find ourselves now with the company. But, you know, there was a lot of trials and tribulations and good luck and, you know, maybe some bad luck, but mostly good luck along the way. Yes. So That's right, Jason, we've, we've been at it, gosh, for maybe close to 14, more than 15 years. If we go way back, maybe you can tell the group a little bit about how, you know, ForeFlight came to be uh, before it was what everyone knows it to be today. And we can talk about some of, you know, the innovations and the disruptions that we were, we had the good fortune of uh, riding on top of, but it really all started with you and your wife. Yeah, that's true. Like, so I guess it was back maybe in 06 or so. I had uh, recently gotten my instrument rating after sort of taking some time off from flying. And uh, even some of the basic stuff about like crosswind landings and so forth was giving me trouble. 
Uh, my instructor, nice guy, but he kind of cut me loose pretty quick um, when I started back up again. And so I was sort of learning on my own and uh, relearning on my own, I guess I would say. Um, and one of the things I, I wanted was to be able to really quickly see how bad the crosswinds were at whatever airport I wanted to go do some VFR flying at. And so I created, uh, along with my wife, she was uh, helping me out a lot. We're both software developers. We made a tool called for, for Flight Desktop Edition. Um, I guess it was really just for Flight at the beginning. And what it was all about was seeing what the runways look like and how the METAR winds or the TAF forecast winds were going across the runway. And it would give you different alerts about like visibility problems or if the winds exceeded a, a set threshold you, you put in there. And then uh, I think it was 07 or so, you, you reached out via an email. Do you, do you remember much of that? Yeah, I was. I remember I was using ForeFlight and uh, the ForeFlight Desktop Edition at that point in time, and I, I had a project that I was working on myself. Uh, it was called My Metar, and and kind of like uh, the that original version of ForeFlight. I think I reached out to you and said, "Hey, you know, I've got this project, and you've got yours, and customers can log into my application. Maybe they should log into yours as well." And, and that uh, I can think began started the beginning of the collaboration. Uh, and you know, I think when we were starting out you know on 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 figuring out what to do we couldn't have imagined that you know 14 15 years later uh we'd have an application that is serving the needs of uh pilots around the world in every segment from student pilots that are just learning how to fly and i remember you know one show that we went to showing our application to a five-year-old girl with her you know pilot father and just seeing her be able to interact with the application but uh, all the way up to uh, military and, and commercial aviation customers. So today, ForeFlight uh, is a global company serving pilots around the world in flight training, in uh, personal aviation pilots that uh, fly their own airplanes, to most of the corporate flight departments around the world, uh, uh, over 80% of airlines of the world through our development work with Boeing, and even many of the militaries around the world, including the US Air Force, many government uh, uh, agencies, uh, uh, operators like the hurricane hunters that go out and, and try to uh, figure out storms to pilots flying um, uh, uh, firefighting missions you know, out in the West. But uh, we could have never imagined that um, we would be able to do that, uh, to serve all these customers and make an impact the way we have. Um, you know, but, but we're fortunate to have ridden on top of a lot of innovation that happened along the way that when we were starting our collaboration, we just never imagined. And maybe you could highlight some of the innovations that happened in the market that gave us the opportunity to build this application uh, that so many around the world use. Yeah, I mean, we were we were fortunate. We jumped on the iPhone right away. Uh, Apple noticed us. We were, you know, there was no app store back for that first year of, of the iPhone, but they noticed us. They kind of put us in a listing. They had a, a listing of different, uh, different apps that were sort of uh, web apps that were styled properly for the iPhone because that was the only way apps really worked back then. But they got us early access to the development kit that we would need that they put out for creating a native app, uh, you know, a real app on the, on the iPhone. And we, uh, you know, we shifted gears pretty quickly there. We had by that time brought in our other early, early founder, uh, Adam, who came in a few months after we had, you know, really officially started the company, but he was a, already an expert in that kind of development. So that was a huge help, but, you know, getting on to the app store when it was day one, when it was first formed, I think was a huge deal for us. You know, we were in there in terms of aviation apps by ourselves for, I don't know, many, many months. I remember being shocked. We were still months into the app store and I couldn't believe we were the only, you know, real aviation app in there. And the app um, store for, for many of us, the, the app store was a, a remarkable uh, invention before the app store, you know, we'd go to bookstores and you'd get software on a CD. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd get it, um, you know, at a Best Buy in a, you know, in a box, but software used to be something you wouldn't picked up in a box and then installed, you know, on your computer and the app store created a new distribution mechanism and a way for customers to pay for that. Uh, and we happened to be the first aviation app in the app store in 2008. So, the iPhone was disruption number one, and then the App Store came out in 2008. Fortunately, we were the first app there uh, in the store. And I remember, I think uh, that was before the days of really fast reporting and payments from Apple and a whole sort of month went by and 
we got our first check and it was, gosh, I remember seventy, eighty thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. like that. So th that was a big disruption in terms of being able to deliver software to many people that had these devices really quickly. Yeah, I remember that it was a night or two before the App Store launched and we happened to be invited to lunch by some Apple folks and they they basically were giving us the hard sell that we needed to price our app at, I think it was 99 cents, something like that. Like that was pretty much what Apple wanted every app to be. And we said, no, no, it's going to be $75. And they were like, no, because no, you, the that original, Yeah, and the original subscription before App Store was $75. So we just sort of stuck with that number and it was right, pretty right. radical. Uh, in the app store when it launched in 2008. Yeah, it was amazing how few features we had back then for that price. And now, you know, roughly the same subscription is a hundred bucks a year. Um, but the feature set is orders of magnitude beyond that and far more capable, obviously. But yeah, anyway, that, that was, that was interesting. Um, I'm glad we stuck to our guns there because, you know, that was, uh, at 99 cents, we would never have built a company and the app would have died pretty quickly. So. It was, it we, was good to be able to sustain. We sort of interestingly got the label of the most expensive application in the App Store, <laughs> um, you know, compared to 99 cents. And we got some press around that until, you know, some some silly applications came out that priced themselves at, you know, $1,000 just um, right. to, to test that out. Um, but it was, uh, it was something that we got a lot of attention for. Uh, and in the scheme of things today, you know, seventy-five dollars for an application that does so much um, is a real bargain, it's especially at a, you know, a hundred dollars uh, today. That's true. That gave us the foundation to start, you know, building some applications. And between two thousand and eight and two thousand and ten, when the iPad came out, I remember we built a number of different applications for pilots. We built one that let you look at charts, uh, sectional charts. We built one that let you create a checklist, and another application that let you file a flight plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another application to look up airport information. And then we had a partnership with the AOPA, who's been a great partner of us for all of these years and, and really helped us in the early days. Um, mm -hmm. So we're grateful for that uh, long partnership there. Uh, but we built an application called the AOPA Airports application that introduced the brand to hundreds of thousands of pilots. And then you know, come 2010, you know, we made uh, a big decision uh, to change our our business model and smash all these applications together, and I remember that being a pretty uh, pretty interesting time. Uh, what do you remember from that? Yeah, so that was our version three, as I recall, kind of late two thousand nine or so, and um, we were because of the App Store forced us to. We were in this sort of one time payment thing where you would pay seventy five bucks, and then as a customer, and then you know you would get all the data updates every month, all the work we were doing, but there was no you know, recurring subscription there. And we could see the writing on the wall that uh, that wasn't going to build a, a company that could last and that could actually support the app, keep it running reliably and keep data up to date. And so we took a big leap and, and changed back to our original subscription model. Um, and you and Adam worked tirelessly on figuring out, you know, what that would be and, and how it would all work. There's a lot of stuff under the covers there to, to, to do, but we released it. And with that, we had a 30 day trial capability and our sales went from whatever it was, you know, 40 grand a month or something. I don't remember what it was then to zero. And that was because everybody changed from the old version of the app to the new one, just like we wanted them to, but they were making use of the free, free 30 days. And so we were a little freaked out, but after like a week or two, we started to um, actually see the sales ticking back up to normal and people were, you know, were subscribing and they, I think they saw the value of the app by that time, obviously we'd added a lot more features, uh, but the price was still the same, just, just yearly. Um, and, and things started to do really well. So yeah, that was kind of a scary month, maybe one of our scarier months. I don't know. We've had, we've had some interesting times, but, um, you know, it got, it got more interesting the next year in 2010 when, when Apple announced the iPad. Well, I remember, so we got a call uh, from Apple uh, to come take a look at this new device that they were creating called the iPad. Um, and it was interesting that we got that invitation, I think probably in February of 2010, right when we were looking at this no revenue situation from having made a big change and you know, wondering whether or not we were going to have a business or have to go back to working you know, our day jobs. Uh, but we went out there and, and got an opportunity to see four flights. Uh, four flight running on an iPad or make it work on an iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in a room with a lot of really big companies uh, that were 
uh, you know, figuring out uh, what to do with this new device also. Um, and so Adam and I flew out there and uh, we realized, I think at that point, that this, had, this device had interesting opportunity. I don't think we went all in on it. Um, you know, uh, I think in our history, better to have, to have been uh, lucky than good in some in, in instances. And, you know, we weren't really sure this iPad thing was going to uh, work out, uh, but we uh, we put some effort into making a four flight work for the iPad. And fortunately, in April, um, the iPad launched along with the iPad App Store. And four flight again was the first application to uh, aviation application to run on the iPad in in 2010. And you know, revenue started to tick up a little bit uh, that year or that that month. Uh, but it was really uh, at the end of April of 2010 when an iPad came out with a GPS receiver. And that was really uh, a big game changing uh, innovation for uh, aviation, where, uh, as Adam would say, you could put a blue dot on a map and he never realized just how valuable it would be to put <laughs> that blue dot uh, on a map. Uh, but when that GPS enabled device came out, we now had uh, a, a nice device with a long battery life uh, and uh, you know big screen that we could then show your GPS position on. And that was a really big deal because before then you had to buy a little accessory and plug it into uh, an iPhone or the iPad. Uh, and this made the iPad uh, able to show your position uh, uh, without having an accessory. Uh, and so that's when our business took this traditional hockey stick change in trajectory uh, and we went to Air Venture that year, uh, and we're the first company to show off uh, an iPad uh, uh, there. Yeah, well, that was like, yeah, that was the first kind of real, real show we we did. I mean, we had visited there not as exhibitors many times, but that was the first real booth we had. I remember bringing those posters up in the, I think I took a Cirrus up there, and you know, it was very uh, mom and pop uh, still at that point. We had a few, we had a few employees, but not much, and. I went up there with one of our one of our support guys, maybe our only support guy at the time, and uh, you know we had reached a maturity level or at least had somebody helping us with support instead of just me and you. Um, but yeah, we were totally swamped. You know, the iPad had been out for a few months at that point, so people were starting to think, huh, you know, this is this is a pretty interesting device. You know, we we as a company before it came out, we weren't so sure. Like you said, you know, we said, well, we need to hedge our bets. Let's make sure we support it. But I don't know. I think once we got it in our hands, we realized, yeah, this is perfect for approach plates and whatnot. And, you know, that was demonstrated at Oshkosh with the booth totally full. Um, me and, and the other guy, we were continuously answering questions for the entire day, nine to five, whatever it was, we could not leave for lunch, could not leave for a bathroom. The aisle was was you know filled up with people, and I remember calling you that evening. I called you and I called a couple other sort of friends of the company that we had, and I basically said, "Guys, I need I got an emergency here. I desperately need you to come out and help." And as I recall, you scrambled and got up there for us, and, and one of the other guys that was kind of local came over and spent time in the booth to try to help answer questions. Um, but we realized we had. Uh, we had something special at that point that, you know, we had managed through dumb luck and some hard work to put ourselves in a great position to uh, to do something pretty cool in aviation. And that period was interesting because, you know, the iPad came out, it was new. We were putting aviation software on it and it was pretty controversial at the time. There were a lot of, um, you know, skeptics about whether or not this device would work in the cockpit, uh, whether it should be in the cockpit. Uh, and there was a number of years of uh, evolution or, 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 I guess, education that uh, vendors like us had to do with folks like the FAA um, and instructors, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, because pilots were buying these things and bringing them to their flight training. Um, so there was, you know, many years where there was uh, a lot of skepticism about the potential for this device in the cockpit. It's one of those things that. Today, you look at it and go, I, you know, I, I can't even imagine a time where someone would doubt whether or not this tool uh, would be helpful uh, in the cockpit. And there was some follow on innovations that emerged that added to that skepticism. Um, I mean, one of those was the evolution of ADSB, which has been a real transformative technical innovation that 
we even were skeptical of uh, at the very beginning uh, and, and really kind of late to adopt. But once we did, we did that in a way that uh, delivered a device that was battery powered and you know wireless and uh, was able to broadcast ADSB weather and traffic uh, to pilots. And one of the controversial things at that point in time was you know, whether or not we should actually show traffic targets mm -hmm. um, on an iPad, because the adoption rate of ADS-B in 2012, when these devices started came, coming out, was really low. I mean, pilots weren't putting in their airplane. There wasn't a lot of traffic to see. But, you know, our friends at Sporties really, um, I think, probably said it best, which is, you know, the, the target, uh, the traffic target that I see is better than the one that I didn't, right? So, um, I think we relaxed on that a little bit and we got to ride uh, that ADSB uh, innovation. And um, what have you seen that do you know, to the business and to um, aviating over the past, say, you know, nine years? Yeah, that was, that was a big deal for us. I would say we sort of took what I think the, the approach that Apple often takes when they're entering a new market or a new type of device. We looked around and we saw these ADSB receivers and they didn't blow us away. They were kind of rat's nests of cables going everywhere and sort of, I don't know, they just they just didn't feel as polished as what we were interested in. And, you know, but we saw the potential. We realized, yeah, there's not a lot of traffic data out there yet, but the weather data is is broadcast. And it was maybe half, it was covering about half the country at that point, but it, it was it was reasonably, you know, well in, in place. And so we took a step back and said, you know, what are the what would be the perfect device for us? And we we found a hardware partner um, in, in Pario when we were working with them uh, and through that first version of the Stratus and, and quite a few after that, that could really sort of hit our goals for super simple one button operation, totally wireless, you know, battery, battery powered and, and can run off ships power and so forth. And once we got that out there, we did a good job of getting support in the app for it. In fact, there was a little bit of a serendipity around that time that I just remember I was, we were still a remote company. I don't know that we had any offices, maybe a little one in Houston near you, but I was in South Carolina at the time. And we got this, you know, new receiver or prototype of it that we were working with Aparia. And there just so happened to be at the Rock Hill, South Carolina airport, an ADSB tower that went up. And it had it physically been up for a few months and I wasn't really sure what it was, but then no kidding, the day I got the prototype from from the folks from the Harvard team, they lit that tower up and activated it. And I was able to start using that to actually code, you know, live uh, to get radar and METARs and everything in the app. So it was just another one of those pieces of, of really good luck. We released it a few months later, maybe it was in Oshkosh, I, I can't remember. Um, but it took off really well because I think people agreed with us that sort of what they needed was that ease of integration. Like, I don't want to put 20 things together and try to make it all work. Just give me the package, have it work well with the software, easy with the hardware, dependable. And uh, and we found that balance with that. And yeah, it, wor it worked really well. I think over time, putting that data in there and really good GPS that you can feed off of those devices and so forth has, has made an impact on, on safety, I, I think, throughout the industry. Um, you know, we've seen control flight and ter terrain go down during this time period. And I think weather related accidents too, I don't have hard numbers on that, but I believe that's been you know, positively benefited from all of this free data being available and easy, you know, easy access to it as well is, is important. So. Yeah, I remember when, you know, we started investing in, in ADSB and when we were able to see METARs and TAFs and even radar information, it made me think back to my first cross country where I took a Cessna 152 not far and you know got a printout of my weather briefing at a, a like a, a WSI station at an FBO and printed that out and took that in the airplane and you know it was a hazy day and you had no idea what the weather was going to be like at the other mm -hmm. airport and uh, today at least in the you know, United States or where ADSB is deployed you know it's hard to imagine not having that information available. Uh, and like you said, we have seen since 2012 a real significant reduction in both, uh, as you mentioned, CFIT accidents and weather. Um, you know, other than um, some CFIT that we're seeing that we're still trying to figure out how to build technology to avoid, like, um, you know, pilots flying in a mountainous terrain and not really understanding aircraft performance. 
um, we've seen uh, weather related accidents and CFIT go way down. I think between 2012 and maybe 2018 or 19, some of those weather incidents were down as, as much as 40%. And when we look at you know, some of the CFIT uh, trajectory changes, that as a category has, has gone uh, down far enough in priority that it's not something that is on the minds of safety folks at the moment. They're now worried about things like power plant failures and you know, mechanical issues because the technology has made all of these categories of accidents like uh, you know, mid-air collisions and areas where you've got these tools, CFIT accidents and weather accidents have, have really made an, an impact. Um, but we're still working on areas like, uh, we've putting, been putting a lot of investment into runway performance and analysis so that pilots can really understand the performance of their uh, aircraft in different conditions, you know, sea level, the mountainous terrain and different temperature conditions and, and do those calculations uh, easier and easier. Um, so it is, I think, been one of the, of the things that you and I talk about being most proud of is not only have an application that pilots really love, but um, are bringing a lot more pilots back to ground after after they fly. So let me bring us maybe a little more towards present day. Um, back in 2017, you know, one of the another big milestone in the company was we started partnering with Jeppesen. And, you know, before that, I would say we were very much competitors kind of in a different space. They were more into the uh, airline aspects of, of this type of software, whereas we weren't. But we realized that we could partner up and, and kind of have the best of both worlds. They have incredible data, incredible charting. Um, and we have, you know, not to toot our own horn, incredible apps and, you know, good support and the the you know, production value of getting everything out on a monthly basis, you know, and, and making sure everything's neat and tidy. Um, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how that's gone and and what it led to from there? Yeah, you bet. I think, you know, uh, in 2017 or 2016, 2017, you know, Jefferson approached us and you know, asked for a collaboration uh, to help us improve the application called Flight Deck Pro that was used by the airlines. And important to us in that period of time was being able to deliver, you know, Jeppesen charts to our customers because we were growing in the business and aviation and military space. And, you know, those uh, products are really essential to the safety of navigation and, and everyday operations. And so we aligned around a partnership where we would help them build a next generation application for the airline market. And we would be able to deliver Jeppesen charts inside of ForeFlight. And I think, you know, that collaboration as measured by again customer impact uh, has been uh, has been great both for flight mobile customers being able to have truly one application that they can use to do a lot of their planning and flying with uh, has been impactful and allowed us to expand you know more deeply into those markets but it's also given us an opportunity to impact uh, the lives of you know commercial and military aviation pilots around the world by inventing or reinventing this uh, flight deck pro application and so those are if we look at our product suite today there's the whole four flight mobile suite that our team builds but our team also builds the version of the application for the commercial market and the result of that after a couple of years of collaboration was a realization that you know our futures are not only more tightly bound together but um, you know dependent upon uh, one another and that's what ultimately led to uh, the acquisition in 2019 of four flight uh, by Boeing. Um, and in that time, we've still been able to, you know, maintain our culture and our velocity uh, and, uh, I guess, spread our wings a bit further into more regions of the world where we get to serve militaries like the Indian Air Force or the German Bundeswehr or um, you know, the Royal Canadian Air Force, uh, and, you know, the, the military demonstration teams around the world that uh, use those products. And so, um, you know, we recognize now, I think, collectively as, a, as, a, as, as two companies or you know, as, as one that, you know, our, our role in global aviation uh, is essential and you know, that, that gives us a lot of energy uh, and focus still on, on, on building those products. But, you know, the challenges of serving every pilot on every, in every corner of the planet and, and all the complex airspace and regulatory environments is, you know, a challenge that we have, you know, for the next decade is, uh, adapting our products to fit every pilot in every region of the world. And to sort of bring it all all back together here, you know, we're again, you know, to the Air Club of New England, so just super grateful for the nomination uh, and for the award. Um, it's been a, a, a privilege to be able to, again, build such an amazing application that 
uh, so many customers love and build a team uh, that's been uh, you know really the driving force behind uh, the, the success of, of the business uh, and um, you know we'd love to spend some time with you uh, in Q a and a uh, and and answer some of your questions so again yeah. thank you for the nomination and the award yeah thank you so much it, it's it's an it's incredibly meaningful to us and uh, it's it's hard to come up with the words beyond just thank you but it's an amazing uh, amazing thing to to be honored this way so thanks Tyson and Jason, we've got a couple of questions that have popped in for us. First one on the list for uh, for Tyson is uh, what new features are on the horizon for Four Flight? You know, that's a key. We get that question a lot. And uh, the answer is we don't want to spoil any surprises. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think one thing customers frequently remark about is how much comes every month. And, you know, that's a, a you know, a principle or a philosophy we put in place a number of years ago, which is to have this monthly uh, cadence. So I can assure you next month will be more surprises. Uh, Jason, for you, how, have there been any offshoots into other facets of aviation or outside aviation that ForeFlight is able to uh, to do now? Well, I mean, we've, uh, we, we've thought about, uh, you know, other markets where there's a lot of similarities with aviation, you know, in particular the marine side and so forth. But um, honestly, we've stayed very, very much focused on, you know, the app that, that you see today and that we put out on a monthly basis. So I would say the answer is basically no, just because we, uh, we're so busy there. Tyson, how do you balance investment in various four flight levels? Oh, great question. Um, you know, one of the one of the things we try to do with every release is uh, figure out how to put something in every tier for everyone. Um, the the more complex the features are, uh, and the more value they ultimately de deliver, is a big factor in what goes into a, a higher tier product. Uh, for example, our flight planning system and our runway analysis capabilities uh, have become very sophisticated over the past few years, and there's a very large team behind that. And so in order to you know, continue uh, funding those, uh, those teams and those innovations, we've got to make sure that the work that they're doing is balanced with the, uh, the business case around those things. But we do, as I said, really try to think about, is there something we can do that you know, benefits everybody that uh, solves uh, um, you know, a pain? And an, an example of that that we did recently, which uh, we use now every day ourselves is our daily weather feature. It's a 10 day forecast and it shows you all the weather conditions um, you know, over that period of time you know, by hour. And that's the sort of thing that we said, well, that's, that's really a generic capability for everyone uh, that we um, you put in, in that tier. Uh, and then 3D was something, again, you know, very sophisticated feature, um, you know, a challenge to engineer that and maintain that. And so that's something we, we put into the, into the premium tier as well. But trying to, trying to find the right balance of making sure we get a good return on the investment, because that, that's fundamental. And then you know, making sure that we're delivering some capabilities to uh, all tiers. Jason, for you, has the acquisition by Boeing had any impact on the pace of innovation you've been able to pursue? Yeah, it has. It's accelerated in um, quite a few ways, but I would say the, the biggest way is the access to the um, incredible data production capabilities they have. So um, an example of that would be the taxi routing feature that we added fairly recently, maybe six months ago, but that is backed by some extremely complex data that tells us which taxiways are connected to which, and some are one way and some are two way and so forth. They, um, they, through the partnership with them being able to give us all that data gave us a massive jump start. Um, and that that sort of pattern has repeated itself quite a few times. Um, so that's been helpful there. And they've let us be very you know independent in terms of how we operate the business, you know, just like we were uh, before the acquisition too, which is which has also been good. Tyson, with the addition of the GPS receiver in the early iPads, were you prepared to advance new features quickly using that? Or did it catch you off guard? Uh, I'd say we were prepared uh, for that. And one of the 
technical developments that helped us be prepared is the, the, uh, the invention of the GPS dongle, right? Uh, which is uh, something that existed before some of these uh, devices had uh, GPS inside of them. Uh, so we were able to advance some of those capabilities pretty quickly. Uh, so there were so there were some things that were a, you know, a bit more challenging to do. For example, you know, for those who fly uh, instrument or even look at airport diagrams and for flight and see your position on the map, getting those charts to uh, display that dot precisely uh, where it should be on the map, given that airports sometimes aren't drawn to scale uh, correctly, was a huge challenge for us. And I remember. Jason and Adam and I be in, in our uh, in, a, in a house we rented in Austin trying to figure out how to do that. So that's an example where certain elements that leverage the GPS took a bit longer to develop. But we, we I think we were able to adapt some of those things uh, once that capability uh, was available. Jason, this one's for you. How did the iPad versus paper chart acceptance evolve from your perspective? Yeah, there was definitely a um, collection of fellow pilots that took to it really quickly. And those may have been folks that were coming from using our app on the iPhone. And, uh, you know, when at, at that stage of the game, for us, the app really was focused on being a paper replacement. Like that was sort of goal number one. Um, we had some weather and we had, you know, I think we had filing capabilities. We had some other stuff, but that was a core aspect to it. And we even had started down the iPhone, but the screen was so tiny, especially the old iPhones that, um, you know, when the iPad came out, it was a, it was a sea change in the ability to actually use uh, that, that system as a paper replacement. So I, I think it was adopted pretty quick, but, you know, as with any, any technology, there was certainly a tail where, um, you know, people kind of had to get used to it over the years. And, you know, at first there was some concern about the legalities of it and so forth. And, the regulations have always been pretty reasonable on that stuff. So, you know, there was that educational process, but um, I would say, yeah, it went, it went pretty quick. And certainly for us, you know, ourselves, we were, we were of course using it uh, daily to make sure it worked right. And um, for us, it was second nature to get rid of the paper, you know, really quickly. And Jason, I would say one, one thing that really helped give the iPad a lot of credibility was uh, I think it was about six months after the iPad came out that Jeppesen and executive jet management uh, and NetJets uh, got approval for uh, electronic charts on an iPad. And so, so that was a big milestone in getting the industry and the regulatory uh, bodies uh, comfortable with the iPad and the cockpit. So that, that was definitely, that definitely helped to bring it into business aviation uh, and, and military and commercial aviation as well. That's, yeah, that's true. They had to do the pressure testing and and they kind of put it through its paces just from a you know hardware standpoint, is this thing going to hold up in, in flight? And you know, thankfully it did well. Tyson, what would you call the four flight product category? It's an electronic flight bag, but there is so much more to it. Yeah, you know, we've we've stopped using that name electronic flight bag. We now call it an integrated flight app. And that is similar to what we think about in an integrated flight deck where you have, you know, you know like in the G1000 or the, you know, the Garmin systems where you have multiple large screens, they've integrated all of these different systems into one, uh, you know, larger system in the airplane. We view ForeFlight similarly, which is it now integrates all of these different modules, flight planning maps, airports, field performance calculations, runway analysis, one engine out procedures, fuel tankering, uh, and it brings all that together in one integrated whole. So that's the word, that's the label that we use for that product category today. We've got a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, Jason, what percentage of the business comes from GA pilots versus commercial and airline customers? Oh yeah, I might have to hand it to you, Tyson. It, it used to be 80% uh, GA, like personal aviation. Um, if not even higher. And uh, I forget, Tyson, when was kind of our first business aviation? Um, do you remember when that was? That was in 20, uh, 2010. It yeah. was when Walmart's flight department called us and said in, in the fall of 2020, 2010, after the iPad came out, that they were thinking about using the iPad in their flight or op operation. And that was one of our first business aviation customers that we used to build some of the systems that we now have to support flight operations that have many users and many aircraft. 
as far as the business split today, you know, probably about 65% of our business is consumer and the remainder is split between you know, commercial, military, and business. Uh, and, and that mix is, is changing all the time. And you know, one of the benefits of the Boeing acquisition is our ability to be introduced to militaries around the world. So, so very, for example, very soon after the acquisition, we sold for flight to the Indian Air Force. Uh, and we've done that uh, in other you know, large militaries around the world uh, pretty consistently. And with the uh, fusion of uh, the, the Jefferson Flight Deck product, uh, that we're, we're going to be sunsetting that and, and moving customers into ForeFlight for viewing Jefferson charts, uh, that will drive a more adoption of ForeFlight in the international community where uh, we're still growing uh, and, and finding new customers there. So that, that's roughly the split between consumer and then our business aviation and, and more commercial markets. Tyson, along those lines, do you create features specific to the military or do they request specific features? We do create uh, special features for them. For example, one of the features the flight demonstration teams needed was the ability to be over a specific target at a very specific time. For example, if they're going to be uh, overflying the field right after the national anthem, right? They needed to know exactly when to be on target. And so we built a feature for them to uh, compute that time and figure out when they needed to be over certain waypoints so they would uh, be at the right place at the right time. And there's many other things uh, like that that we do for the military. They have special flight planning needs, uh, the ability to you know, stay in the air for long periods of time if you're an air tanker, for example, and you're delivering fuel. So long answer, but the answer is uh, uh, yes, we do develop special features for the military product. But one last question that's come in. Has ForeFlight ever considered adapting the software to produce an FAA certified avionics hardware product? Jason, that's yours. Yes. So the uh, the word certification, at least for me personally, is terrifying. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I will say um, you know people have uh, they've certainly asked for that, um, and I know people are using you know the 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 iPad sort of informally, you know, in the panel, not as not as true certified avionics, um, but no, our, I mean, our focus is, you know, where we are because we can innovate at a, at a you know, incredible pace and and not be slowed down, um, and just you know, still bring new features out. So that's that's been our focus. Thank you very much for taking our questions this evening. I'm going to hand it back to David. Thank you, Keith, for, for moderating the question and answer. Those are some, some great questions, and we appreciate you guys, uh, both of you, Tyson and Jason, answering those. And once again, I'd like to, to thank you, congratulate you for, uh, for, this, for, for earning the Cabot Award 2021. As I mentioned, you're very worthy recipients, and, and many of us are grateful users of your product. And I also agree with you that I think it's better not to go the certified route because we want to keep, keep the innovation going and um, that's what's made your company so successful over the years. Um, and uh, this is, I think it was quite appropriate actually that you, both of you got the award this year because this is actually the first time we've ever done a virtual capital award. So it was appropriate that the recipient was a technology company. Um, back in 1952, when the award was first started, um, there was essentially no computers and you know TVs were even rare sometimes in households. And um, the price of a house was, the average price of a house is, I think, nine thousand dollars. So we've come a long way in, in over the years in technology, and 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 it's great to see that, you know, that a lot of that technology is being adapted to aviation in so many ways, and Four Flight's an important part of that. So congratulations again to both of you. I would like to thank everyone on the call tonight for attending, and we will have this presentation available. It's being recorded, so those of you that want to see it again could view it at a later time and and those of you with the people who missed the presentation tonight if you have anyone you know who missed it it will be available later for viewing so i wish you all a good night safe flying and thank you all <laughs>